Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Kate in a moment, but also to say from the British Association for Local History that we are delighted to be here. Um, the first conference of your organisation is obviously a very important landmark and there's a great deal in common between our two organisations that I think has got lots of potential. Um, and as time goes on, we shall appreciate that more and more, I think. And certainly the sort of topic that you're dealing with today is something that local historians around the country are extremely busy um, beavering away. And it's something that our association has been involved in for some time. And Kate has been a central member of our council in coordinating a lot of the work. So she'll be able to tell you a lot more about that. Um, you can read about her in your programme, um, but just particularly to say that the publications, Remembrance and Community, we have copies of on our table, but also the article that she's written recently for the Institute of Historical Research is available on their website and will shortly be available on ours, um, and pulls together a lot of the ideas that are relevant to the topic and to local historians. Uh, so I'm delighted to introduce Kate. I think I'm now broadcasting. Can everybody hear okay? Good. Um, well, I very much echo what uh, Jane Jane Haas has just said ab about uh, being uh, delighted to be here and feeling that we've got so much shared ground, um, interest in locality, community, family, and how those two fit together. I'm one of those historians that believes if we can understand fully the evidence offered in those sorts of ways, it's going to illuminate in unique ways our understanding of the broader histories. Um, I'm just doing some reviews of a whole batch of the many publications that are now coming out on the First World War for the BALH uh, journal, The Local Historian. And one of the things I'm looking at is a new diary that's uh, being discovered. And as Phil said, there are all kinds of records you can discover afresh, I think, uh, and bring to notice. And in this case, it's the Algal uh, Historical Society who found a wonderful diary from a local shopkeeper, a man called Binder, who on the 25th of July, 1914, suddenly realized, and it did come to most people very late, there is going to be a pan-European war like none other we've seen for a whole century. Uh, and that this is a unique experience, I must keep a diary. He hadn't been doing so before, and he did so every day until November 1918. And the Andal Historical Society have uh, found this through family history connections and have published it. And it's, it's a wonderful record. So a hundred years ago, in the uh, weeks we've, we've just been uh, remembering, he was a local baker. And one of his first concerns uh, was that his fellow shopkeepers should not suddenly uh, cash in on the war by putting up bread prices. And the, all the bakers around them got together and limited the rise <coughs> on the price of a four pound loaf uh, to a penny. Uh, so food prices was a concern. And then, the day before the outbreak of war had been a bank holiday and everybody had been on their train excursions and their various um, uh, uh, holiday activities, but they were noticing the men in uniform who were uh, the reservists and territorials being uh, called up. Uh, and the government then says the rest of the week is a bank holiday. And people like Binder at the local level are realizing, you know, that there is a real danger of um, economic instability, what's going to happen. You can't now get gold for your money. And over those first weeks of the war, the government were introducing paper money, 10 shilling notes and pound notes. And there was great uncertainty in that and so many other respects. And that it really made me feel that there are new sources to be discovered, new insights to be discovered uh, at the local level. And that there are dimensions which may be um, of First World War studies that uh, just really haven't been uh, addressed and, and um, looked at fully before. Um, so I do hope that um, the sort of thing BALH is doing and uh, your society is doing will tie in with that. Um, let me just mention, for example, Phil rightly had a lot to say about horses. If you were in a rural area, suddenly this mass 
uh, buying up of horses. And a recent copy of, of the local historian, if you look at that, you'll find an interesting article by Phoebe Merrick on horses in the Great War in Hampshire. Uh, so uh, there's lots to look for there. Perhaps more familiar and you might think less likely to yield um, fresh insights um, is the question of, of war memorials in two weeks' time. We'll be focusing particularly closely for the remembrance uh, rituals on uh, local war memorials. But it does seem there is a, a fresh intensity uh, of, of interest because of the centenary and also because of the recent conflicts and how many local war memorials have that added connection. We don't know exactly how many local war memorials uh, there are throughout the country. There are tens of thousands. There was a, a national inventory, the UK National Inventory of War Memorials, started in 1988. Many of you will know of this and maybe have used it. And I think that recorded over 62,000 war memorials. But I'm very aware, as are others, that as we come to look at war memorials at the time of centenary, that there are very many more than that. Um, the inventory has been relaunched by the Imperial War Museum with the War Memorials Trust. And again, uh, people like us have a role in this to update existing inventory records from the 88 onwards inventory, but also to add memorials to that. I'll be using as an example during my talk uh, the Colchester War Memorial and how that was made, how that was formed. In doing that, I found that there are some 40 war memorials in Colchester, which brings me to, I think, a key point that the minority of war memorials are national monuments or regimental monuments. The great majority of them are non-state funded, non-state directed, local expressions of how people felt about the losses of four and a quarter years of war and how they felt a bound and duty to, in an appropriate way, not allow those names to be forgotten uh, and to commemorate in the right sorts of ways. And that every one of those local memorials is the product of local feelings, local opinions, local choices, uh, local resources, local tastes. What's the wording used? What's the imagery used? Where is the war memorial placed? Is it in a church with access only for those who are going into the church? Is it on the edge of the churchyard on sort of border territory? Is it deliberately in a public uh, space which is neutral and accessible to uh, everybody in the community? There are all kinds of fascinating um, factors. So don't think you know, the war memorial arrived in your place uh, from outside somehow. It is so much an expression um, of uh, feeling and money and power and influence uh, and of course of uh, that key uh, uh, point of contact with the First World War, those who were actually lost. It's also about remembrance, not just memorialization as historians put it. So the rituals of remembrance that grow up around it uh, so it's very much about the people who were left behind. So it is about the women and the children, but also the majority of those who served during the war, who survived. And I think we're right to put an emphasis on the, on the dead and understanding the names and the re experience that represents for that minority. But I find myself thinking very much about those who returned and how they reacted to local schemes uh, for a war memorial. One of the most common debates you find hot on the heels of the armistice and the peace is should we in fact put our resources into creating memorials that would make a better life for those who are left. The people died to secure their freedom and so should it be um, a sports field or a village hall or a new hospital, or just a, a bed in the hospital, or an educational scholarship. All of those sorts of things, swimming baths, all, ma all manner of things are looted.
so it's a fascinating area um, of investigation and uh, there's nothing very standard about it. So what you've got here Is that different? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I hope you were able to. I'm not going to say all that again. <laughs> I thought I'd better say it. Um, so let's start with one uh, example of, of the, the local rootedness um, of, of war memorials. And um, some of you may recognise this. This is Ironbridge, uh, very near to where we are now. And the choice here is interesting. Uh, the actual historic iron bridge is immediately to the left here. So they chose to place their memorial in a, a created open space by the Seven uh, Va uh, Valley Gorge. And amidst the shops and a small marketplace and a local church just opposite. Um, so really at the hub uh, of, uh, of the community. They chose not St. George and the Dragon or an allegorical peace uh, figure. They chose the Tommy, the citizen sh soldier. Uh, and there are some interesting uh, dimensions to local memorials, the sort of democratic character of, um, in this case, the, uh, the statuary chosen, how the names are listed and, and so on. And we look at some examples of that. So here it is the Tommy in amongst the people. Here's the, uh, the large chap uh, sitting on his, uh, uh, his bench amongst the flower tubs. He's just there. He's sort of in the place uh, of the place. One of the things to remember about memorialization, which perhaps puts even more meaning on these local memorials, is uh, that Early 1915, an immutable decision is made not to repatriate uh, the dead. Uh, they're buried where they uh, fell. And so all those um, extensive rituals, which were so important to late Victorian and Edwardian society, uh, of death notices, uh, mourning cards, uh, form, very formal funerals, uh, all of those were lost. And that really, as we know from contemporary personal accounts, exacerbated terribly uh, the experience of loss. So when you had an opportunity after the war to give permanent expression, a stone memorial, a name sort of carved in stone, I think had that added uh, resonance. These are some um, Australian dead, this is from the Australian National War Archive of photographs. Um, on the Western Front in, I think it's March uh, 1918. And then, once the war was over, uh, there was the possibility for visiting uh, the place of death. This was very important to uh, the bereaved. Pilgrimage, to some extent, battlefield tourism starts 1919 onwards. And you see here a visit in uh, uh, northern France uh, that the uh, cemeteries have already um, been uh, <coughs> given the, the British, but not the German or French style, um, almost akin to gardens. They're planted along the rows of the crosses uh, with um, garden-type uh, flowers. But the crosses are still at this stage in the early 20s, the original wooden field crosses. What uh, gave um, national um, uh, memorialization in the battlefield area shape was the work of the Imperial War Graves Commission, um, which was founded in 1917. That didn't dictate uh, a style for local memorials back home, although it, I'm going to suggest it was influential. And on here you have Tynecott, the biggest of all the Ypres salient um, uh, British cemeteries. Mm. And you see here Blomfield's Cross of Sacrifice and the standard uh, very simple white uh, gravestones. Four principles that the Imperial War Graves Commission uh, established. They were that every one of the dead 
should be commemorated by individual name. Second principle, they should be equally treated, buried side by side, they fought side by side, they're buried side by side. Third principle, they should have a permanent marker, so a stone marker. And the fourth principle, that all faiths be respected. So it was very much um, a, a collective uh, equal message. They couldn't be buried in the land they died for, and that's the rhetoric of a lot of local memorials, isn't it? Um, but uh, the, the local memorials pick up the sort of link, in a way, with where they, if they have a known burial place, uh, these casualties ended up. And there develops a commerce in uh, memorials. And on this side, you've got the National War Cross, um, as purveyed by Beckett and Sons. And this is one of the firms that issued catalogues and the example here was picked up by the East Chiltington um, Village War Memorial Committee in East Sussex. Their memorial cross cost £115. They were also thinking they would like a roll of honour, which is the additional uh, thing that many localities have, which is a list of those who served, not just those who died. But because they spent £115 on their uh, local version of Blomfield's Memorial Cross, uh, they couldn't afford the ro role of honour uh, as well. So I mentioned a War Memorial Committee there. What do the British do if they've got something they want to organise? They form a committee. <laughs> and that is exactly what you will find from parish to parish, town to town, village to village. And if you can discover the records, of the War Memorial Committee. You can see something of the workings of who decided to do what, why, how much money they had. Very uh, revealing. And this is Colchester in Essex, and this is the main town memorial. And what you see here is a fairly grand set piece. They actually deliberately created a suitable setting at the bottom of their high street and near to their oldest building, Colchester Castle, in the background. They received a, a gift of the site from the High Steward of um, Colchester, Viscount Cowdery, who also gave £23,000, so they had a start. Um, they demolished a number of houses to create uh, the uh, elaborate setting, uh, and uh, they commissioned, um, uh, through a, a, a builder, a designer, an architect and a sculptor, uh, what you see now. So it brings home to you just uh, what was involved in uh, the process. We do have their records, <coughs> and this is the composition of the Colchester War Memorial Selection Committee. Um, this case study appears in, in the booklet that was mentioned, so if you want to ponder on this, but just to say, saving your eyesight, you can just see just how many organisations were uh, involved in this. So this is a collective, very democratic uh, set of <coughs> scouts. The National Association of Discharged Soldiers, soldiers and um, Sailors. It was only in 1921 that the British Legion became the dominant ex-servicemen's organisation. Before that, there were a number of rival groups of different degrees of radicalism about how ex-soldiers should be treated. And so reflected here at, at Colchester, which started in 1919 to decide its memorial, uh, you have various groups, war pensioners, the Catholic Church, the established church, the chapels, um, Free Church Council, the Trades Council, the Labour Party, the Fellows, the Buffaloes, uh, the secondary schools, um, the Head Teachers Association, the Board of Guardians, and all the principal <coughs> local um, uh, employers, the post office, the gas company. And you get an idea of the sort of multiple belongings or um, associations that those who died have. So I'm sure you're familiar with this um, phenomenon of finding the same people on more than one memorial. <laughs> Um, so here you've got the idea of a collective, democratically determined, central uh, memorial, uh, but you will also find them in schools and in the local, you know, ex-gas works office, in the post office and so on, on, on separate memorials. But they all help to decide. 
and uh, it took a bit of deciding because they had six um, things that were suggested by this committee uh, that uh, Colchester might do. It might build a public baths, have a memorial hall, a new school of art, purchase the castle, build a special memorial building, a new block for the Eastern Counties Hospital or a monument. Uh, so they went principally for the monument, as you can see, and they uh, had to um, identify the sculptor, who's H.C. Fair. This, uh, the images were Victory, Peace and St. George. St. George, the patron saint, uh, religious connotation, also um, good uh, overcoming evil, justified violence, slaying the dragon. Uh, it's, it's got a whole bundle of, of suitable connotations and, and Colchester had those victory peace in St George. Um, this um, uh, example from Colchester um, was reused uh, again in Eastbourne. Uh, so, as I say, there's a sort of whole industry, I suppose, in the moralisation that goes on. The wordings are interesting, aren't they? So, to the glorious memory of the men of Colchester who fell in the Great War. They strove for peace, they served for freedom, they died to live. And very much this rhetoric still in the great War Memorial building years, which are 1919 to 23, the great majority of the wars were created then, in those days, still this firm <coughs> conviction that they died to live, they died for freedom we're not really yet into the more sceptical and sinister, uh, um, cynical reflections on, on the First World War. And then interestingly, to the honour of the men and women of Colchester who stood for king and country and bearing arms all by their work helped to win the war. We talked a bit earlier about the women's role in the war and here's an early acknowledgement of it. Thanks be to God who gave us the victory. It's a widespread phenomenon, as you know, for the 1914-18 memorials to be pressed into service again for the Second World War memorialisation and even for later ones. Colchester is a garrison town, of course, and you can see here to the members of the armed forces uh, killed as a result of terrorist action since the end of the Second World War. And for the Second World War, and to the honour also of those who worked, uh, served and died in the further war of 1939-45. That's a bit muted, even for <laughs> the further war, it sounds like an adjunct. Um, but maybe you, you would think about why there weren't separate uh, memorials for the Second World War, which was an enormous period of loss, maybe proportionately fewer killed, but the, the impact of those five years of war. Perhaps it's something to do with the 1945 mood of making a better society, you know, just embarking on uh, creating the welfare state and so on, and maybe having got a set of memorials, uh, the emphasis is on reusing those, adding to those. And the ceremonies, local ceremonies for unveiling, inaugurating memorials, also an uh, important piece of evidence, and the Colchester, they finally got round in 1923, it took several years to create that spread I've just shown you, um, they actually had an official war memorial souvenir and they buried a time capsule, and it's interesting to think what would they put in that. Um, a memorial like Colchester attracts our attention, it's very well documented, but it's maybe atypical because not many places could afford that. Uh, and this is from the work of Paul Rodzieski, who's done a very interesting volume on Essex in the First World War. He's analysed all the war memorials in Essex and typed them, and 47%, by far the largest number, are simple plaques and tablets. Not everybody could afford a St George or a... Um, um, and 12% crosses, church furniture, roll of honour, stained glass window, memorial, village hall, only 18 places in Essex. Um, uh, and uh, this breakdown again is in the book, rather interesting. So very often we'll be looking at something 
uh, much more modest. Uh, but the repertory is quite wide, so let's look at one or two um, examples. Very seldom in my experience do you find overtly military um, uh, imagery uh, chosen. I explain why St. George is aggressive, I suppose, but justified in the iconography. Um, but this is a, a rare um, exception. This is a stained glass window in the church at Swaffham Prior in Cambridgeshire. And I don't know if you can pick this out. It's got a tank, it's got an aircraft, and it's got a military camp uh, here. And what's on your war memorial will have something to do with who paid for it. And in this case, a man called C.P. Alex uh, was the local squire, and he paid for the local war memorial, and he had spent the war compiling scrapbooks of photographs and drawings um, of uh, uh, military um, uh, equipment and armaments and so on. And that's what he wanted uh, on, on the... Uh, in the window, and that's what he got. The um, national uh, press um, were very sceptical uh, uh, about this, uh, and it, uh, it was commented uh, in the newspapers that this was in pretty bad taste, uh, that this isn't the sort of thing that was appropriate. The Daily Sketch said it was in bad taste. Uh, the Morning Post just satisfied its, itself with saying the windows were unusual. <laughs> Next to it is perhaps um, a more familiar uh, type of memorial. This is at Featherton, a small village in Suffolk. And you can see that it's not in the church. It's placed on the edge of the churchyard uh, with the main street on this side and a lane here. So it's visible to all. And um, I'll show you in more detail in a moment that the names are in sim simple alphabetical order with no distinctions of rank. And that would not have happened on a Boer War memorial. You know, the, I think the, the nature, the experience of the First World War seems to have made it a, a change that's reflected um, here. So they all fought together. But in the church itself, uh, there is this stained glass window uh, to, um, let me get his full title, um, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Doughty Wiley. And he won the Victoria Cross and died at Gallipoli. <coughs> he had served in earlier imperial wars, and he was a landowning member of the uh, community. So there's this individual, St George of the Dragon, with rather uh, incongruously this portrait head of the elderly colonel, middle-aged colonel, uh, in the church. But the collective memorial is this one. And when I look more closely at this, Doughty Wiley has a whole line, but that's only because he's hyphenated. <laughs> and he had to go on the name to get on one line. Everybody, you know, and he's in alphabetical order. And that name there is A Button. And when I looked in the extension churchyard um, at uh, Theberton, I found this very modern gravestone. And my eye was drawn to it by the poppies, so you think First World War. And here is Alfred Button, listed here. Died 16th October 1918, aged 35 years. And the other two names are Donald Button, born 9th of October 1916. So this man was one week old when Alfred Button uh, was killed. Uh, he, di he died only in 1996, and his elder brother, who would have been three years old, born 1913 when his, their father was killed, died only in 2008. And the family choice there was to add the poppies and this line, father and sons united. And so I would never look at a war memorial just alone. You know, there's Doughty Wiley's stained glass and there's the Button Brothers in the extension churchyard. And one gets some ex idea of the social reach of the impact of the war and also the chronological um, spread to war memorials in all kinds of places. This is one that was um, done by a particular firm. So lots of private memorials. And this is a particular area to try and preserve and record if you can. Because things like those for particular firms or a school and things, they can actually be scrapped or moved around. 
And that's what happened to this. Packard and Company Limited um, are at uh, Bromford near Ipswich in Suffolk. Uh, they uh, manufactured um, chemical fertilizers, now part of, subsequently part of ICR. And uh, the Miss Packards, the daughters of the owning family, they created their own painted war memorial to all those who served and all those who were killed. And their culture is not the collective public memorial, uh, but perhaps you can see it's divided, their world was divided into staff and men, white collar and blue collar, and it's very much listed uh, by order of rank. Uh, so here's a war memorial that uh, evokes a very different ethos. Packard's has closed down, so now uh, if you go to Bradford Church, um, here in the local parish church is this, with the portraits uh, of the, uh, the dead. Who pays for it? Who influences it? Uh, is shown here in a very fine uh, war memorial at Stanway in Gloucestershire. If any of you have ever driven down from Stowe on the Wold towards Evesham, down that very steep, scarped slope down the main road, it's just on the right. Now, Stanway Village is, is a little way away, but they chose this position because they wanted uh, this to be in an open place uh, by the, uh, the main through road. And in this case, um, 1920, you've got a, a particularly high quality piece of sculpture, uh, which is described by Pevsner's Buildings of England, Outstanding Bronze of St. George and the Dragon by Alexander Fisher, on a stone column and plinth by Sir Philip Stott, with lettering by Eric Gill, no less. Mm -hmm. And this is because uh, Lord Weems, uh, who's bereaved in, in the war, was the local landowner, and he paid for this, and I guess the idiom of the memorial and the quality of the artwork reflects that. And the choice of epitaphs, the choice of wording, for your tomorrow we gave our today. I guess that will echo with many people. And this is derived from Greek literature. And that officer class that went into war in the trenches, many of them did carry pocket, pocket classics of, of Greek and Latin. And this is an English translation of um, Simonides' epitaph for the Spartans of Thermopylae. And it was later uh, adopted for the uh, Comina Memorial in World War II. And here it is on a Gloucestershire village memorial. By contrast with that, just sort of reinforcing this point about war memorials reflecting the resources and the people <coughs> in their places. This is Crowell. Um, a tiny village church in Oxfordshire that had uh, only two dead, 1915 and 1918, in what's called the Great European War. And they simply got a wooden plaque, which looks to me as if it was locally lettered. It's very, very simple uh, indeed. One <coughs> general rule that's reflected here is that Rural war memorials tend to have a lot more detail on them than urban ones, which uh, may just have the, the names, or Colchester has the names in that local town hall on vellum rolls because they couldn't fit over 1,200 names on the war memorial I showed you. In villages, fewer dead, although proportionately, you always work out what proportion of dead that was to the population. So, not saying there wasn't the impact, but they have more space. So here we know the month and year they died and their uh, regiment, their unit. So that's perhaps at one end of the spectrum. A little case study um, which perhaps drives home the links uh, between community and local history and family history. And this is Great Rissington in Gloucestershire. And there, the war memorial is in the church. This was a traditional, perhaps rather conservative, rural uh, community, and the church dominated the choice of where the memorial should be. And there are 13 names on that tablet. There were no official lists of who was a local death. 
uh, and communities again made their own rules up to a point. <coughs> so perhaps you will have found uh, the same person in the, on the more and more than one place. It might be where they went to school, where they moved when they got married, where they went to work, all of those uh, things. But there were 13 people that Great Brissington uh, considered its own, uh, and here they are. We had a bit of discussion earlier about which units um, people served in. In rural areas, it tends not to be the Powell's Battalion phenomenon because there weren't the critical mass, you know, to make up um, a whole battalion. But you do get, especially in the 14, 15 period, the volunteer period, you do get sort of block uh, volunteering and you do get concentrations in local regiments. Um, but you can um, see here that there are eight different units in those 16 dead from the one village. There's the Gloucestershire, Worcestershire, Cheshire, Warwickshire, <coughs> Somerset and Leicestershire regiments and one chap in the Army Cyclist Corps. Um, you can also see the places of death and it's overwhelmingly Western Front with just one other Salonica. Notice that two died after discharge and you, I always find that rather sad uh, the lasting effects of, of injury or disease uh, and people, you think they were, they're going to have made it and then they die in late 18 or 19 and they're on here too. Uh, and you can see the, the dates uh, of death. They didn't lose anybody from Great Rissington in the first two years of the war and then seven in 1916 alone, two in 1917, three in 1918. So that year, 16, 1916, again and again, you look at memorials when you put the dates to it. Uh, very, very tough times. And I don't know if you can see from the back, but so Souls, Fred Souls, Walter Souls, Arthur Souls, Alfred Souls. So, and Albert. So, five souls. And they were five brothers. And here, Great Rissington met Hollywood because do you remember the film Saving Private Ryan in 1988, Spielberg film? Central storyline in that is about an American family, three of whose sons have been uh, killed, and a fourth is going <coughs> into harm's way at D Day. And the American authorities want to get him out because the propaganda sort of impact. Do you remember the story mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, you know? every brother might have been uh, wiped out and uh, you often find brothers uh, uh, on, on more memorials but five is one I think perhaps the most ever and this case um, attracted renewed attention in 1988 and so in the, uh, the booklet, I use this as an example of how you can do the family uh, history investigation. I think in a, in a company like this, you are probably all, by definition, experts at, uh, at, at tracing individual families. So I, I won't go into uh, too exhausting detail, but just to say that apart from the Stone Memorial, Rissington, very interestingly, also has for all but one of those dead, actual photographs of the men themselves. Um, and this makes me think how much the impact of the deaths and ways in which they could be remembered was not just the public post-war, uh, but during the war. Uh, people went to their local photographers and they got their picture taken in uniform and their families had their pictures taken and they swapped them as mementos. And Rissington has made this additional, if you like, more informal type of memorial. And for me, seeing those side by side in the church is that public and private worlds uh, of, of remembrance uh, coming together. Um, I've become increasingly interested in this. And again, I think it's an area where uh, we as local family and community historians uh, have useful things to do. Uh, because where are those photographs? What happened uh, um, when uh, people were dying? Um, 
before ever you got to the official memorial, you begin to get street shrines and shrines in people's homes with photographs and so on. This is a street uh, shrine in Bellamy Street in Hull in East Yorkshire. And there's a framed roll of honour. And then there are photographs uh, of the local uh, dead, pictures of the royal family, uh, paper chains. Do you remember making paper chains at Christmas? They've got that as well. Uh, this is right at the end of the war, so they're also celebrating victory, but they're also remembering. And they'd set up this street shrine, and here it is with the additional decorations for victory. And can you see it's the women and the children who, who are the movers in the <coughs> grassroots are uh, unofficial. Um, churches and, and officialdom had a bit of trouble coping with this because it was a bit spontaneous and not always aesthetically very pleasing and it was outside the areas of influence but I think it's very significant and I think if you can collect um, uh, photographs, uh, recollections of, of um, shrines uh, like this a rare example is in St Albans in Hertfordshire, some of you may know it um, the um, uh, street corner shrines which were put up during the First World War still exist and here are three of them. And this is really laying clay. This is um, Bardwell Rose, own dead, uh, commemorated. But here is one of the Rissington dead, Walter David Soles, private in the Worcestershire Regiment, died in 1916. And I just use this as a case study of some of the standard sources you can use. One thing that that threw up was using the a Commonwealth War Graves Commission was that they got on this uh, memorial the wrong date, he in fact died in August. So do cross check, do triangulate your sources. The other thing I found by looking at local newspapers was how much they, um, as a sort of proxy for a proper burial, uh, they put in death notices and at Great Rissington for every one of their dead they had a memorial service which for all other purposes was like the funeral service they would have had. They rang the bell, people came, there were flowers, uh, there were little uh, sympathy cards printed. All that kind of ephemera um, of remembrance and bereavement. Um, quite a bit of it must still exist somewhere. Sorry, and just to say that um, maybe family re recollections, and I found um, four uh, Walter Soles, um, personal rec recollections. Would you believe Saga magazine in 2001, having found the story of the five Soles brothers, uh, went to Rissington, and the daughter of the brother's sister, Kate, recalled village gossip that said their mother Annie must be well off with so many pensions for unmarried sons. <laughs> I mean, it really makes you think about, you know, it's not a sanitised thing, remembrance. This much, much distressed their mother, it would. Mrs. Soles, the mother, kept a candle burning in the window of the family cottage in the hope that Fred, whose body was never found, might return. That's another thing. And thirdly, from these recollections, she wouldn't stand for God save the king because she blamed him for the war. Lost five sons. But the, that's been reproduced actually in a number of subsequent articles that the Western Front Association have published on, on, on the souls of Rissington. But there actually is a second sentence that reminisce. She wouldn't stand for God save the king because she blamed him for the war. She stood just once at my school, that's the niece's school, so as not to embarrass me but it was painful for her. Um, sometimes war memorials get contentious, and this is a case study again, as in the book, uh, of Dorchester on Thames in Oxfordshire. And there they had a shrine in the uh, Abbey Church, the parish church, from 1916. And they had a very Anglo-Catholic vicar who lived just nearby in the Grand Parsonage. Uh, and he wanted George and the Dragon at £250 in the church. Uh, and the local community dragged their feet. And the poor man was elderly, the vicar, and he died in 1920. There was still no memorial up. They rescinded the decision that he had dominated and uh, uh, made a, a decision 
to put up um, a memorial in the main street uh, without George and the Dragon uh, and uh, representation on that war second war, war memorial committee included widows. Interesting. So don't be surprised if you end up with several memorials. This is Islip in, in Oxfordshire. Uh, and in the church, there's a sort of rather Anglo-Catholic pre-dieu with the names of the, the dead and British Legion flags. So from 1921, the British Legion dominates uh, the rituals of remembrance as far as organised ex-servicemen go. Uh, and then... Uh, at the edge of the churchyard, looking out onto the village green, a Calvary, which is a very Catholic uh, image. They would have seen these by the roads and the battlefields of Belgium and, Nor and northern France. And here's one in an Oxfordshire village. But the main village war memorial is not either of these. It's up the road uh, at the main crossroads in the centre. And... Islip is the village where Robert Graves, author of Goodbye to All That, one of the first of the sceptical anti-war accounts, Goodbye to All That, published 1929. Well, in the early 20s, Graves was actually resident uh, in uh, this village, in, in Islip. Uh, and uh, he served as a Labour member of the parish council. I think he was the only Labour member, it wasn't that sort of village. But he recollects that the servicemen coming home from the war um, didn't uh, think they'd got the, um, uh, the best deal uh, always. They wanted um, a recreation ground, uh, um, but instead they got uh, these sorts of memorials. Just seeing if I can uh, find you some direct words from uh, the man himself uh, who uh, reflected on uh, Islip. The essence is that he was asked to contribute to the Remembrance Day service in the church by the rather liberally minded vicar, and he read the Secret Sassoon poems uh, about the dead rotting, corpses rotting in the trenches and so on. Um, this was met with some outrage except by the, uh, the parson uh, himself. Uh, but Graves claims that although the king um, called on ex-servicemen to wear their medals with pride, their campaign medals with pride on remembrance occasions, they wore them but they put them under their raincoats. Yeah. So a slight bit of contested ground when it comes to the rituals of remembrance that went with the memorials once they were established. So if you're interested in this, do look at those rituals, starting with the choreography and the content of the unveiling ceremonies. Um, this example is from Pittsford in Northamptonshire. Uh, and you can see there's um, the clergy, the church wardens with their staves, uh, a senior military figure, uh, a union flag. Uh, but most of all, this row here, the older men, the women, the children. These are the, the bereaved, the families, ready with their wreaths to lay. And there's usually a newspaper report or a commemorative brochure that will tell you what hymns were sung, who spoke, sometimes who said what. You know, what justification is being given? What is the spirit? The, how are we understanding the, the sacrifice? And then through the 20s, this is Snape in Suffolk, 1929, uh, the repeated rituals. So here's Snape War Memorial, the main road is closed. Here are the slightly flapper, the younger women generation left behind, perhaps, uh, plus the clergy and the standards of the ex-service organisations. The context in which the war memorials um, are used subsequently, of course, is, is, um, is interesting in itself. And I'm just going to finish now um, with uh, a small number of examples of that. So this is Ireland. Have you ever thought about war memorials in Ireland? Uh, this is at Pettigo, which is on uh, part of the villages in County Fermanagh and part in County Donegal. 
So at the creation of the free state, half the village is in Northern Ireland and the other half is in, in the, the new uh, free state. A uh, very different context for remembrance. Memorials in the South, until recently, have either been reviled as examples of, of, of oppression or just neglected. But all that is changing now. It's extremely interesting. Whereas war memorials in the North have other significances loaded on them, don't they? The Ulster Division and the Somme and so on. Their testimony to the unbreakable links with Britain and the shared um, uh, sacrifice. So here are the memorials of Pettigo in that context. This is the All-Ireland uh, First World War Memorial, the Great War of 1914-18. And then just down the street there's this, which is a memorial to four local Republicans who died, I quote, fighting against British forces in Pettigo in 1922. But I guess most of our studies won't be of, of being of that kind. Uh, and here is Alborough in uh, Suffolk, which some of you, I think, know. Uh, this is now four memorials in one. It was unveiled in 1921. Uh, it wasn't uh, located in the church. There was a war memorial done by the bereaved father of one of the Garrett family, the dominant family in that part of Suffolk, that had been unveiled before the end of the war, actually, in the church to his son and other local dead. But when it came to the collective memorial, they wanted to be down on the seafront by the Moot Hall, their principal civic building, and there it is. They had an exhibition of possible designs. Local people had a say in uh, what was um, uh, erected and they also opened an institute, a sort of club where ex-soldiers could uh, go where there was a library, newspapers and somewhere to smoke and so on. So it was a two-part um, memorial and uh, on this memorial there are 83 men and one woman, a nurse, overwhelmingly army <coughs> dead. There's somebody from the New Zealand expeditionary force, have you found that? Where a lot of emigration from British communities to the Dominions, to Australia, New Zealand, Canada in particular. These are the young men who came back to fight for the mother country uh, during the First World War and they are regarded as local dead and they are honoured in the place and connection. So we've got that. What are the other three memorials? This is now the Second World War. 25 killed in action. So that ratio, 84 to 25, is not untypical, I guess. Then, there are 23 men and three women who died as a result of war, op um, war operations. This was a training area, a coastal area. Uh, they blew up a whole lot of landmines by mistake on one occasion, for example, accidents, training accidents. And the, uh, the fourth one is to civilians killed by enemy action. The local post office had a German bomb um, uh, dropped on it in 1942, I think. So this has become a collective memorial now to more than one war and to civilians uh, as well as, as military. And it's here now that the Remembrance Day service. It's very funny actually reading uh, uh, around the rituals of remembrance. Do you, any of you know examples of this where people fall out uh, as to where the uh, remembrance services should be? They do gather here now every November. They then march up the hill uh, to uh, a service in the church. So my final image, whenever I look at a, a war memorial and I find myself looking at them more and more, there's a tremendous amount to be found out and interpreted. Uh, by all means, look at the names of the dead and look at their biographies individually. But if you look at them as a group, if you look beyond them to those who served and those who came back, if you think about their families, and as Phil told us, what was happening in these places during wartime. So here is a 1940s photograph from Clipston in Northamptonshire. This man, I guess, of an age to have served in the Second World War, is contemplating his local uh, First World War Memorial for England, home and beauty. Is that what they died for? That's what Clipston decided to put on its memorial. Thank you.
deeper. And I'm sure lots of burning questions like we had in the first session. Who'd like to... Uh, oh, I have one at the front. Right, first of all, in request, please, could you put the table up where the different animal normals might be shown? At the very beginning, you had a table. Of, of, of the types of people. That's not tablets on that up, please. Yeah. If you could find that for us, please. It's some way back, isn't it? Right at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. It's it and it's in the book. <laughs> oh right. <laughs> okay. That's the one, thank you. And the other thing I'd like to say is you at the beginning you showed a picture of the Ambridge Gorge Museum. Uh, Ambridge uh, Gorge yes. is such a, yeah. There was a very really late night program about that. And they discovered that one of the names on there it didn't actually die. Yeah. And the other thing is there's a memorial not far away from a land gentry who went and brought his son back from the dead on the field in France. And he's one of five who was brought back to Britain yeah. in the first world war. Yeah. The authorities were absolutely adamant that uh, bodies should not be repatriated. They were brought under tremendous pressure, especially from those with influence and money to do so. And there was a big parliamentary debate not, lo uh, uh, not long after the end of the war as to whether that policy should be reversed. Uh, obviously a handful of people got away with it. The other thing you find is that uh, particularly officers' families bring back the field crosses uh, that marked the original burial place of their sons uh, on the battlefields. And you do find those uh, in local churches in, in the main, in some uh, localities. Uh, so that they've got this connection with the, the, the actual place at the time where their, um, their loved one uh, was, uh, was buried. Yeah, so uh, a few obviously got away with Any other questions? Oh, two, three. Suddenly I saw no hands and then suddenly there was about three or four. <laughs> uh, mine's more of a comment really. Um, I've researched the Oldham War Memorial that you mentioned uh, um, and also the Framingham War Memorial in Suffolk. Oh uh, yes. Um, and I always thought the idea of the memorial started after the end of World War I. Mm. But looking at the local papers in Framingham, um, in 1916 they were already talking about a memorial and where they were going to put it. So yeah. even two years into the war, and they were already talking about that, and I was quite surprised. I thought it was something that had happened after the end of the war. It's very interesting. That, that's why, as, as I was saying, I've got more and more interested in seeing how people were responding during the war. And the first references to shrines being set up in the street or perhaps in local churches seems to be predominantly from 1916 onwards. And I did, you know, was commenting that the rate of deaths, particularly with the song, but more generally onwards, it's just accelerating then, and there seems to be this upsurge. The church authorities in Oxfordshire were, were a bit daunted by this, and it's at that period that the beginnings of what are now called Diocesan and Advisory Committees um, These are the DACs of the bodies that have to give a faculty to put on a, a monument, in anything that alters church fabric on church property. And um, the Oxfordshire one uh, came into being, and the bishop has some slightly despairing phrase about we're going to be inundated, uh, you know, by, by uh, 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 people wanting memorials. The Garrett Memorial in Albrook Church that I referred to is in fact a family initiative. And when the church didn't get the main memorial, which is my reading of it, I noticed that they tagged breast plaque with all the local dead name onto the bottom of, of Garrett's memorial. Uh, so you do get the names in the church and in the town as well. Thank you. We've got a question here and then a question in front to finish. Hello. Um, I'm researching That's villages good. that are very close to Great Rissington. But oh, really? Great Rissington. Yeah. And I have discovered in the school minutes of the village of Condica, which is quite close, that the headmaster at the time, who was a long-serving headmaster and had a son himself in, in the war who did return, mm -hmm. he has done and recorded against the school roll number of every child that was involved in the war. Mm -hmm. And there's a record of the memorial, very similar to the Great Rissington one in the church, that he achieved funds for and was displayed in the schoolroom. The school closed in the 1960s, and I've spoken to the last cleaner there, who says who's now eight, over 100, um, and she says it certainly wasn't there in, 19, in the 1960s. I, I need to go through where the children went to in 1960, etc., to find that. But 
I've also been wondering if anybody has experience, as you said, so many people went to studios to have yes. those portraits done. Yes. And I have found some mentions of that when those studios went out of business, their plates were sometimes oh, recovered mm -hmm. and stored centrally by a society. Now I have I need to investigate it, but I wondered if anybody already has looked at anything like that. I mean I do think it would we were speaking earlier about um, the boom to businesses, local businesses that the war could engender and, and photography would be one of them. The sad thing is um, that so often once the, those personal photographs are out of context, mm -hmm. you can't mm -hmm. identify them. I've got a relative who was a clergyman in Manchester during the First World War and I've got a collection of, of photographs that came down from him and there are all these haunting faces of young men and sometimes um, working class Lancashire young women with their children in their best hats sitting on wooden chairs you know, with a backdrop and I don't know who they are uh, but I think that was almost certainly the context in which those photographs were taken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got one last question here. I gave everybody one of my little leaflets at the Barnsley War Memorials project and I'd just like to reiterate what Kate said. The survey in the 80s produced 74 war memorials in the Barnsley Metropolitan District. In the last year we've increased that number to over 450. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, so there are a lot. They can also, if you follow the definition that's on the Imperial War Museum site, they can be anything from a tablet to a table and everything in between. Um, so when you go into a church, don't just look at the windows and the memorials, check out the crosses of procession, check out the pulpit, check out the tables, check out the pews, everything, and you will find names and details that will be invaluable in doing your history of your local area. Brilliant. Thank you. Just before Kate literally runs off stage, <laughs> she's very acutely aware of the timing. Um, a big round of applause for Kate, thank you very much for that.